India. It's the world's second most populous country, with a staggering 1.4 billion citizens and home to six cities where populations exceed 10 million. People are everywhere, yet as you walk around India's largest cities, a surprising revelation emerges – the conspicuous lack of skyscrapers. This striking absence of giant buildings can't help but raise the question, where do all these people live and work? If these densely populated urban centers aren't housing their residents vertically, where is everyone fitting in? The undeniable truth is that India's most populated cities lack distinctive skylines and optimized urban space utilization. Hindered by a rocky path to urbanization and a sluggish legal system, cities like Mumbai, Kolkata, Delhi, and Bangalore have fallen behind in the race to build tall cities. However, new developments and initiatives by Indian urban planners are striving to harness the architectural wisdom of their ancestors, recognizing that many European and Western-inspired buildings don't necessarily align with the region's climate conditions or energy consumption capabilities given the nation's current infrastructure. Since gaining independence from Great Britain in 1958, India's economic power has experienced a series of highs and lows. Now India is on an unstoppable trajectory to become the world's third largest economy by 2030. With a burgeoning population fueling this economic surge, India's business centers anticipate relentless expansion over the next few decades. In comparison to other global cities such as New York or Shanghai, India's urban landscapes appear to be an anomaly in terms of their skyline. What do the unique skylines of Mumbai, Delhi, Bangalore, and Hyderabad reveal about the current state of Indian culture, politics, and commerce? And how are these cities poised to transform in the coming years? Let's uncover the reasons behind India's lack of skyscrapers and why this might be changing sooner than you think. Delving into the roots of India's urban landscape, we must journey back to the 1600s, the era when westernization cast its first transformative ripples across the nation. Granted, this is merely a blink in India's vast historical timeline. But for the purpose of this video, it serves as our stepping stone into the past. Chennai, Mumbai, and Kolkata, formerly known as Madras, Bombay, and Kolkata, emerged as the principal port cities of the British East India Company. To put this in global context, the British East India Company was the largest and most influential trading company of its time, shaping global commerce and geopolitics. Encircled by forts constructed in the 1600s, these cities ingrained segregation into their design, with civil lines keeping the Britons and their Indian neighbors apart. Yet in Bombay, the walls of separation began to crumble as Indian businessmen infiltrated the fort's borders and fueled local economic activity. Trade flourished, and as more Englishmen ventured east, integrated suburbs sprouted in the countryside. A patchwork of architectural styles both accentuated economic disparities and revealed a penchant for style over efficiency. In Kolkata's Churanjeev neighborhood, Grand mansions and straw huts stood side by side, painting a picture of stark contrasts. For comparison, European cities like London and Paris were undergoing their own urban transformations during the same period, with more uniform architecture and structured city planning. As one observer in 1768 described, Kolkata was a confusion of very superb and very shabby houses, dead walls, straw huts, warehouses, and I know not what. As British influence spanned centuries, integration became inevitable. Havelis, public squares, and neighborhoods melded Indian and British elements into their designs. During the British Raj, European architects birthed the Indo-Saracenic style, blending Mughal and Rajputana architecture with Victorian Gothic and Baroque. India transformed into a canvas where architects, engineers, and designers fused European and Asian aesthetics. Fast forward to 1857, and India stands divided. There is growing resentment against the British East India Company due to ongoing westernization efforts and the controversial doctrine of lapse, which violated a Hindu law stating that a ruler could appoint an unrelated heir to succeed them. 
Instead, the British East India Company asserted that in instances when a leader had no related heirs, the territory would be annexed by British forces who displaced the Indian aristocracy. Protests against the doctrine resulted in violence breaking out across the country and culminated in the Sepoy Mutiny. So named for Indian troops who led it, the Sepoy Mutiny saw thousands of Indian soldiers, British officers, and innocent civilians massacred in the crossfire. The bloodshed prompted the British Empire to amend the British East India Company's leadership with a more regulated system, the leadership of which took the form of Indian Civil Service, or ICS. The new elite, English-educated ruling class, governed regions across India under British supervision. Despite their education, many Indian students found themselves excluded from the ICS and noticed lack of Indian representation in provincial governments. This frustration set the stage for the Indian National Congress in 1885, a nationalist body that would spearhead boycotts of British goods and champion Indian independence. As the seeds of nationalism took root in India, an intriguing development unfolded on the other side of the world. In 1885, the same year as the Indian National Congress, Chicago unveiled the world's first skyscraper, the Home Insurance Building, designed by William Le Baron Gini. This 10-story marvel stood 138 feet tall, featuring a fireproof steel and metal skeleton reinforced with concrete. This revolutionary design transformed tall building construction and city planning forever. After the Great Chicago Fire of 1871, an ordinance was passed prohibiting wooden buildings, prompting architects and engineers to rethink their materials, and Ginny led the way toward building upwards. The Home Insurance Building was the first ever to incorporate structural steel in its framing, a design element that would influence generations of builders. But a lot more innovation went into construction of the first skyscraper than just one designer suggesting the use of steel. Many engineers and architects had not even considered relying on steel in their designs as the material was hard to come by and was very expensive at the time. But then, a world-changing innovation by Henry Bassemer in the 1850s revolutionized the industry with his invention of his namesake Bessemer process. The process involved blowing air through molten pig iron in a large, pear-shaped container called a Bessemer converter. The oxygen in the air reacted with impurities such as carbon, silicone, and manganese, creating heat and producing slag. The oxidation removed the impurities and lowered the carbon content, turning pig iron into steel. The molten steel was then poured into molds to solidify and be rolled into various shapes and sizes. The newly developed process enabled unskilled workers to mass-produce steel in an affordable and efficient manner, and the new innovation helped fuel the Industrial Revolution, as steel's hardy, weatherproof qualities made it ideal for building railroad networks, which in turn facilitated the spread of trade and travel, helping the world become more connected and move information a little faster. Meanwhile, Elisha Otis's invention of the safety elevator in the early 19th century allowed for the safe transportation of workers and materials to higher stories of a building without the hassle of pulleys and stairs. While the elevators were significantly slower than the ones we'd recognize today, the Otis Elevator Company's design revolutionized the feasibility of crews working at tall heights and further enabling the skyscraper construction. Without these two essential developments in the form of the Bessemer process and the safety elevator, the home insurance building in Chicago would have been little more than a pipe dream. Chicagoans couldn't help but look up with awe at their city's newly defined skyline, and other cities started taking notice as well. Visitors from all over the world flocked to see this marvel of construction, and soon more tall buildings began popping up all over the U.S. When Chicago hosted the 1893 World's Fair, the city attracted over 27 million visitors, inventors, pioneers, and dreamers to witness the latest innovations in city planning and engineering. The fair debuted the Ferris wheel and saw AC electricity and fluorescent lighting designed by Nikola Tesla light up Chicago skyscrapers at night. Innovation fundamentally changed how cities looked and consequently how people were living in them. The 11-story tower building was built in New York City in 1889, spanning 162 feet 
While the Wainwright Building in St. Louis, constructed in 1891, stood 10 stories tall, reaching 147 feet, these structures proved that tall buildings could be designed with both form and function in mind, rather than just being built for utility. In Europe, however, skyscrapers were slower to take hold, with the Royal Liver Building in Liverpool opening in 1911 as Europe's first skyscraper. At 11 stories tall, with a 316-feet clock tower in its center, the building was the tallest in Europe until the Torren Tower in Antwerp claimed the title when it opened in 1932 on the ruins of a building that had been destroyed by bombing in World War I. As a quick aside, while a case could be made that the 16th century city of Shabam in Yemen could be considered the first city to boast a skyscraper with its seven-story mud brick towers, for the sake of this video, we're going to define skyscrapers as buildings that are at least 100 feet tall and have a steel skeleton of some kind. But credit where credit is due, the Hadrami urban architecture that laid out Shabam in a grid block system was the precursor to most modern city planning. While it has the nickname today as the Manhattan of the desert, Shabam was around for centuries before Manhattan had its first skyscraper. In 1916, China unveiled its first skyscraper, number three on the Bund, in Shanghai. Standing at a modest six stories, it didn't quite match the heights of its western counterparts. Nevertheless, it set the stage for redefining Asia's urban centers inspired by innovations from abroad. The Hong Kong-based architectural firm Palmer & Turner crafted number three in the Shanghai style, establishing the Bund as the city's new business epicenter. Fast forward to 1941, Singapore's museum planning area welcomed the 16-story Cathay Building. The groundbreaking structure introduced the city's first air-conditioned public gathering space, providing respite from average summer temperatures in the mid-80s. The Cathay Building inspired a vision of comfortable and accessible urban living through the incorporation of more skyscrapers. In 1959, Chennai, India, saw the construction of the 177-foot-tall Life Insurance Corporation Building, LIC, marking India's first skyscraper. In 1961, the 25-story Usha Kiran Building in Mumbai surpassed the LIC as India's tallest building at 260 feet. This luxury high-rise, with two 3,200-square-feet apartments per floor, fostered an exclusive community living above the city. The building boasted five elevators and an indoor swimming pool. By 1970, the World Trade Center in Mumbai consisted of Center 1 and 2, took the lead with Center 1 towering at 516 feet and 35 stories. This building held the title as Southeast Asia's tallest for decades until it was dethroned by the planet Godrej at 594 feet and then the Imperial at 690 feet. Currently, the 1,050-foot-tall Palais Royale in Mumbai, with its 56 floors, stands as India's tallest skyscraper. Many of those buildings are located in Mumbai, which is home to the highest concentration of skyscrapers in India. With 66 buildings surpassing 650 feet and a total of over 200 skyscrapers, this sounds like an impressive number of tall buildings, but India is the world's second most populous country, yet it ranks only 12th globally in the number of skyscrapers. Several other Asian countries outpace India in skyscraper count, including Thailand, the Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, Japan, South Korea, and most notably, China. China, India's northeastern neighbor, boasts a staggering 3,084 buildings taller than 500 feet, 1,035 exceeding 650 feet, and 107 surpassing 1,000 feet. By comparison, India's buildings are both shorter and fewer in number. However, the disparities between China and Indian skyscrapers cannot be easily explained. While many modern cities share similar features, India's rapidly evolving skylines over the past decade have distinguished it from others. To comprehend why India has a comparatively limited number of skyscrapers, we must explore the underlying factors in greater depth. So let's break it down. Why does India have so few skyscrapers? For one, skyscrapers aren't the same as other buildings. Tall cathedrals and temple spires reaching hundreds of feet into the air 
have existed for centuries, but they don't need to be designed so that people can live and work every 14 or so feet. That means bathrooms, and those require complex systems for water, plumbing, and pressure control none of which are easy to regulate or manage. And India faces considerable challenges concerning water resources. Despite being home to 20% of the global livestock population and over 1.4 billion people, it possesses only 4% of the world's water resources. That's a lot of crops to grow, mouths to feed, and people to keep hydrated. And it doesn't even take into account the need for fresh water for other agriculture, hydration, and sanitation. Moreover, fresh water is crucial for cooling motors and generators that generate electricity and power. The Ganga, Godarvi, Indus, Krishna, and Brahmaputra river basins supply India with most of its replenishable fresh ground water. With increasing population pressures, industrial growth, and the unprecedented pace of urbanization India is experiencing, the groundwater is getting extracted from lower and lower levels at a much faster rate than rainfall can replenish. This has led to fluoride and nitrates in the country's groundwater becoming more concentrated, which causes the fresh water from wells to suddenly seem a lot less fresh. Despite receiving heavy rainfall during monsoon seasons, India lacks the infrastructure to store and distribute water effectively. This leads to water contamination and wastage as much of it ends up in brackish lakes or returns to the ocean. To address this issue, desalination plants are being constructed along India's coastlines. However, these facilities are not only expensive to build, but also require significant electrical energy for the filtration process, putting immense strain on India's power grids. According to the World Bank, a majority of urban Indian households only have access to water for a few hours a day with some even limited to a few days a week. Although recent developments have expanded 24-7 water access in some cities, it's not yet universal. Everyone pays for their consumption, but those willing to pay more often receive a larger share, sometimes at the expense of others. India's population growth means that per capita, water availability may remain stagnant or decrease, while per capita, water usage is expected to rise from 99 liters per day in 2009 to 167 liters per day by 2050. This poses challenges for skyscraper construction, as water and electricity play vital roles. Standard practice involves pumping water to a rooftop reservoir, allowing gravity to maintain high pressure as water descends through the plumbing. Additionally, generators in large buildings require water for cooling purposes. Given the high demand for water and electricity concentrated in a small area, it is understandable why city planners are reluctant to replace low-rise neighborhoods with high-rise towers. Increasing the amount of housing in India's cities is necessary to address severe overpopulation. But this may lead to more people being drawn to urban centers, exacerbating issues such as urban sprawl and traffic congestion. The suburban sprawl of uncontrolled metropolises consumes millions of acres of land that could be utilized for agriculture or water retention. However, the vast footprint of India's cities and their suburbs makes it easier to distribute water to where it's needed and to regulate household access and balancing these concerns is crucial as India's skylines continue to evolve. But it isn't just dwindling water resources that cast doubt over the feasibility of constructing more skyscrapers. There are also serious questions about cities' infrastructure being able to support a more dense population that raises alarm bells. And it's fair to wonder whether or not vertical cities would be sustainable given the current state of things. India's urban areas are home to nearly 500 million people or about 35% of the country's total population. That's more than the entire population of the United States, where about 80% of the residents live in urban areas. So while proportionately less Indians live in cities, the sheer number of people who do live in and around them is astonishing. Furthermore, the World Bank estimates that if you include urban sprawl under that umbrella, then 55.3% of India's population lives in or adjacent to cities. With so many people squeezed into the same area for work, housing, and living, 
resources tend to get overused and then under service. Take, for example, the city of Bengaluru, sometimes described as the Silicon Valley of India. On an average weekday, the Bengaluru Metropolitan Transport Corporation moves 4.8 million people on over 6,100 buses across 2,400 routes. In 2022, this resulted in over 1,000 kilograms of carbon dioxide being emitted into the sky. Imagine a scenario where instead of living in sprawling suburbs necessitating long commutes, workers reside a mere 5 to 10 minutes walk from their offices. Such a shift would significantly alleviate India's air pollution problem, benefiting both individuals and the environment. Shorter commutes translate to fewer early mornings, reduced fuel expenses, and decreased pollution in the skies above India. However, there's a flip side to this coin. If the individuals migrated from suburban residences to city center high-rises and workplaces, several consequences would follow. Firstly, they would likely face soaring rent costs due to the city center's premium location. Secondly, companies would need to pay higher wages to compensate for the increased cost of living associated with the higher demand for limited resources. Thirdly, a community of co-workers living miles away would still exist as they remain dedicated to high-paying, white-collar jobs that could alleviate their families from poverty to comfort within a generation. Consequently, urban centers would become more attractive than ever, drawing in people eager to work, live, and enjoy the company of successful individuals in a supportive environment. Well, this is what happened, and also not what happened. As India poured resources into urban development, the results were a mixed bag. Overpopulation surged like never before, with people leered by the promise of success reflected in the gleaming glass of newly constructed iconic buildings. They understood that to access these opportunities, they needed to be in close proximity to city centers. However, the lack of affordable housing for middle and lower income individuals led to the expansion of slums. An astounding 108,227 slum blocks sprawl across 2,543 cities. In Mumbai alone, nearly 60% of its 21 million residents reside in slums. The city has one of the lowest per capita floor space ratios, averaging just 2.9 square meters per person, largely due to the impact of slums. While India endeavors to rehouse millions living in these conditions, the challenge is monumental, particularly as new infrastructure must be built on land already occupied by slums. Other issues caused by cities' infrastructure stem from two key pieces of legislation. In 1947, the Rent Control Act was enacted by the government to protect tenants from exploitation and abuse by their landlords, which in theory is great, but the freezing of rents across cities in India disincentivized private companies from creating housing stock for rental purposes. If there's no chance their investment will grow, there's no reason to invest, right? While land prices were inordinately high, the profit margin for owning small parcels of property were not enticing enough to spur a housing boom. Additionally, for people already in great city central locations, there was no incentive to leave. This created a sense of stagnation in the housing and property rental market. Essentially, the private sector was discouraged from investing in residential buildings, and the average homeowner could not find a property available for sale, let alone rent. The second piece of legislation that affected the number of skyscrapers in India today was the 1976 Urban Land Sealing and Regulation Act. This law, again, was put in place with the best of intentions, lower the price of property in the cities so lower and middle-income individuals were not priced out. The law essentially put a cap on how much land any individual or private company could own. It also allowed the government to take over vacant land plots to construct affordable housing projects. In Delhi and Mumbai, the cap was 500 square meters of land, while in some smaller, less competitive markets, it could be up to 2,000 square meters. This did prevent monopolies from taking over India's urban housing centers. However, it also limited growth outright. In 1999, the law was first partially repealed, 
since there weren't enough programs in place to support the building of low-income housing. Additionally, people had begun abusing the system, using fake identities to buy multiple plots of land, or simply illegally building, but we'll get into that more later. Without enough housing, slums popped up all over cities, bringing with them concerns about sanitation and safety in the overcrowded neighborhoods of huts and shanties. Initially, the government responded by leveling the slums, but these were real people who needed somewhere to live, so all destroying their homes did was lead to a temporary displacement before they found another unoccupied place to live. There was another problem, too. The people living in the slums, who made up as much as half the population of these cities, were the ones providing essential services to those same cities and sustaining the economy. A new attitude was adopted around the issue of slums. Instead of demolishing them and expecting that tens of thousands of people would find apartments to rent and jobs that paid enough for them, slums needed to be rehoused, and rehoused in livable spaces with basic and essential living amenities. Established in 1997, the Slum Redevelopment Authority SRA, aimed to create a slum-free India through slum rehabilitation housing. However, challenges arose from the repeal of the Urban Land Ceiling and Regulation Act. Allowing private entities to purchase and redevelop slum land meant slim profit margins due to endearing rent control policies. Furthermore, rehousing did not address the socioeconomic issues that led to slums in the first place. The height and growth of Indian cities are significantly limited by the quirks of their building codes and the challenges posed by climate change, specifically floor space index, or FSI, restrictions, and the urban heat island effect play crucial roles in shaping the urban landscape and influencing the affordability of housing. So what is FSI? FSI, also known as floor area ratio, dictates the relationship between a building's horizontal footprint and its allowable vertical space. With a lower FSI, meaning lower building volume, and in India, FSIs in cities have been notoriously low. In 1991, Mumbai's standard FSI was a mere 1.3, a stark contrast to Hong Kong's average FSI of 12, New York City's 15, and Tokyo's 20. Modern-day India has seen slight improvements, with FSI allowances ranging from 2 to 5, depending on road width and plot size. However, this remains insufficient to accommodate the rapidly growing population and increasing demand for affordable housing. As a result, horizontal urban sprawl, longer commutes, and heightened pressure on natural resources have emerged as pressing issues. To keep pace with demand, India must invest in better transportation, roads, water, and electricity. Another factor limiting building heights is the urban heat island effect a phenomenon where concentrated human activity in urban areas results in higher temperatures compared to surrounding rural regions. CO2 emissions, deforestation, and the design of cities all contribute to this effect. Urban canyons formed by tall buildings and streets can trap long-wave radiation, further exacerbating the issue. A Terry research study found that Indian cities have experienced a 2 to 3 degrees Celsius increase in temperature over the last 15 years, with a 5 to 7 degrees Celsius difference between cities and rural areas on summer nights. Tall buildings and narrow streets in Indian cities create an environment where heat is easily trapped and airflow is restricted. Engineers are exploring green cover options to mitigate these effects, while urban developers aim to preserve green spaces at ground level for public gathering. As discussions surrounding the inclusion of skyscrapers in India's cityscapes emerged, architects and urban planners initially advocated for a focus on low-rise buildings. These structures, with their lower construction costs, would cater to the needs of middle-class families. India, a nation founded on principles of justice and protection against exploitation, as enshrined in its constitution, sought to address the challenges faced by a significant portion of its urban population. However, as the reality of widespread poverty and substandard living conditions persisted, it became evident that a new approach to residential development was necessary. 
the pursuit of alternative solutions and innovative building strategies could pave the way for a brighter future in India's cities, transforming the nation's urban landscape and promoting social equity. Another hindrance to India's skyline development is how illegal construction projects have created setbacks of all kinds. During the 1990s, developers exploited loopholes by using fake names to acquire more property than legally permitted. Another insane example happened in 2022 in the city of Noida, where a pair of skyscrapers were built on what was supposed to be a designated green space within a larger housing society project. The plans for the complex originally consisted of 14 nine-story buildings. However, the plans were repeatedly altered, resulting in 15 11-story buildings, followed by the unauthorized addition of two 40-story towers known as Cyan and Apex. Neighboring residents objected to the colossal skyscrapers as the unauthorized changes would increase the local population, prolong exposure to the construction zone, and set dangerous precedent for unscrupulous developers to bypass regulations for profit. The government responded with explosives. 3,500 kilograms of explosives to be precise, more than enough to bring the illegally built towers to the ground. And then, of course, there's the fact that one cause for the scarcity of skyscrapers in India is that, until recently, managing without them simply hasn't been seen as that big of a problem. However, the situation is becoming increasingly dire, with millions of people living in slums, facing heat, malnutrition, dehydration, and disease. By 2030, an additional 250 million people are expected to inhabit India's cities while the number of cities with over 1 million residents will rise from 42 to 68. By 2050, India is projected to add 416 million people to its urban population, the largest increase worldwide. With increasingly accurate projections, it's clear that the current infrastructure and housing availability cannot support this population growth. Rising temperatures, extreme weather events, water shortages, and air pollution are among the challenges India faces in the coming decades. Addressing the housing crisis is essential for India to achieve economic success. But it isn't as simple as replacing old buildings with new ones. Mumbai's skyline is slowly changing with more high-rise buildings being constructed, but the process is gradual and affected by various factors. India's skyline is shaped by a combination of political, social, economic, and cultural consideration, as well as by chance. Iconic structures worldwide, such as Toronto's CN Tower or Sydney's Opera House, have emerged from unique sets of circumstances and the innovation of their populations. Comparing India's skyline to those of other countries can be misleading, as the reasons for the low number of skyscrapers are rooted in a complex interplay of history, policies, and events. The assumption that India should have more skyscrapers or is behind its peers may not be accurate. India has a history of adapting ideas to suit its people's needs, and its architects and engineers are well-versed in the nation's urban landscape. Studying ancient Indian architecture could provide valuable insights into constructing buildings suited to India's environment. The future of India's cities remains uncertain, but the changing skyline will likely reflect the ongoing developments within this complex nation. As India's cities evolve, keep an eye on the skylines. They'll be an excellent indicator of the country's progress.